Hello everyone, today I will be presenting on a case of long-term care in Rome and Britain, which was seen as part of my master's research. This research was conducted at the University of Bradford with an assemblage from the university's collection. Bioarchaeological studies often examine physical impaired individuals, but rarely investigate the care those individuals would have required and if they received it. The aim of my study was to examine physical impairments within a Romano-British population to examine if and how those physically impaired individuals would have been cared for. This is relating to physical and medical care, not emotional care, and was accomplished through the utilization of Lorna Tilly's bioarchaeology of care methodology. So for this research, I examined 49 individuals excavated by the University of Bradford from King's Home, Gloucester in the UK. King's Home was a military fortress in the suburb of Gloucester founded around 60 AD. The individuals examined were dated to between the 4th and 5th centuries AD. By this time, the fortress had developed into a city with a majority civilian population and the area was in an economic decline. Of the 49 individuals examined, 30 were seen to have pathologies or traumas and five models of care were developed from this. So this presentation will focus on skeleton 131. This individual has been published on twice previously by Dr. Charlotte Roberts et al. and Dr. Lara Castell-Navarro et al. However, these papers focused mainly on the bioarchaeological and paleopathological analysis, with the latter's paper touching briefly on the funeral rites and possible social standing of this individual. My research aimed to develop on this previous research to build a better understanding of the individual's lived experience and a better insight into the health-related care they may have received. This was achieved through the utilization of Lorna Tilly's bioarchaeology of care methodology, taking osteological, archaeological, anthropological and medical knowledge, a model of care was developed for this individual. This individual was determined to be a probable male who died between the ages of 15 and 16 years. He was found to be laying in a supine position facing west-east with his arms appearing to have been placed across his torso. The only finds associated with the burial were seven nails suggesting he was buried in a coffin and this was common for the area and the time period. Radiographs of the left and right upper and lower limbs show clear thinning of the cortical bone of the left femur, tibia and fibula, which is seen in the second radiograph here, and some slight thinning of the bone of the upper limbs, but it's less evident, again, as you can see in the first radiograph here. The left, upper and lower limbs appear overall to be more gracile than the right, with the muscle attachment sites appearing less robust, especially around the lower limbs. The left fibula is bowed medial laterally and has a smooth surface overall, which you can see in the second photo here, suggesting no active pathology at the time of death. The bone also shows none of the characteristics of muscle insertions, such as ridges or depressions on the surface of the bone. Limb asymmetry was also clear to see uh, in the measurements of the mid shaft and subtrochantric sub diameters. The measurements also show a clear difference in size overall between the left and right limbs. This difference is noted in the third column uh, and the left limbs consistently measured shorter and smaller than the right. Several changes can be seen on the articulating surfaces of the less left distal tibia, talus, and calcaneus. The superior articulating surfaces of the calcaneus appear smaller on the left and then on the right, though there does not appear to be any significant displacement of the articulating surfaces. There is, however, a fourth articulating surface located at the posterior third of the sosentaculum talli. When the ankle joint is fully articulated, as seen in the first image here, this additional articulating surface appears to articulate with the medial malleolus of the tibia. The head of the talus appears to be displaced medially, uh, as you can see in the second image here, and has a poorly defined depression of the neck. A groove can clearly be seen running along the posterior portion of the trochlea, running anterior laterally to the posterior 
uh, of the medial edge of the trochlea, which is arrowed in the second photograph here. The cranial vault displays superior lateral bossing of the right frontal and left occipital bones, which has resulted in a slight distortion of the visiocranium to the right. The maxillary and mandibular first molars on both sides have a linear groove in the dental enamel, indicative of linear enamel hypoplasia, which is not visible in any of the other recovered teeth. There is also a minor unilateral depression of approximately two millimeters to the right lateral vertebral bodies of L4 and L5. The rest of the lumbar vertebra also show, show some height asymmetry, consistently measuring higher on the left. However, this is to a much lesser degree. The spinous processes of the lumbar vertebra also show displacement to the right. The degree of asymmetry and atrophy seen in the left limbs is indicative of long-term disuse, which suggests paralysis of the left arm and leg. The appearance of the muscle attachment sites along the upper limb suggests that some mobility may have been regained in the arm after a period of disuse. The bowing of the left fibula, along with the changes to the articulating surface of the tibia, talus and calcaneus, suggest that the individual had unilateral clubbing of the left foot and the foot would have turned in medially. The linear enamel hypoplasia seen on the molars suggests a period of nutritional stress between the ages of two and four years. When taken together, this suggests that the individual may have been afflicted with poliomyelitis between the ages of two and four, which resulted in unilateral paralysis of the limbs and clubbing of the foot. Differential diagnoses have been suggested for this individual by Charlotte Roberts and Keith Manchester. However, regardless of the diagnosis, the individual's limitations would have been largely the same. And as such, the level of care they would have required would have been relatively similar. And so the results of this study are left largely unaffected by the differential. So this individual may have had an onset of vomiting, a headache, high fever and or pain, which likely would have been localized to the legs. This is indicative of an acute poliomyelitis infection. However, at the time, this may have been indistinguishable from any number of viral illnesses. Texts of the time suggest that a diet of barley gruel twice a day was a common treatment for such a viral illness, and a skin or bladder filled with hot water akin to a modern hot water bottle may have been applied to areas of pain. The onset of illness would have lasted between two and 10 days, during which the individual may have uh, required help with feeding and cleaning themselves. But given that this individual was likely a young child at the time, this level of care would not have been seen as abnormal for them to receive. While this initial onset of illness may have only lasted a few days, the resulting paralysis and club foot would have remained. The paralysis of the left leg and clubbing of the foot would have rendered the individual unable to walk unaided, and the paralysis of the left arm would have rendered them unable to use a walking aid. Therefore, it is likely that they would have required help from at least one other person for mobility. This individual would have been able to dress and feed themselves. They may have required assistance in preparing clothing and food in advance, however. Massage and manipulation may have been applied to the left arm to aid in regaining some mobility in the limb. While partial mobility appears to have been regained, the arm would still have been weak and the individual may not have been able to lift heavy objects or grasp items well. However, this mobility may have granted them some greater independence than they had previously. Archaeological evidence from Britain shows that individuals at the time had methods for attempting to correct clubfoot. However, there is no evidence that this was attempted for Skeleton 131. It's often suggested to be tried on younger infants, so that's possibly why it wasn't attempted in this individual, if the club foot was uh, attained at an older age. The care they required would have lasted up until their age of death, so a period of approximately 10 years. 
Due to this individual's young age at the time of their death, it is unlikely that they would have been expected to have an occupation yet. However, due to the rural setting of King's Home, they may have been expected to contribute to the running of the household, an expectation which they likely would have been unable to meet. Due to their lack of mobility unaided, it is possible they would have remained largely isolated to their home, rendering them unable to socialise with their larger community very often. The way in which they were buried is considered to be normative for Roman Britain and for this area, and the individual's grave was not isolated from the others, as is sometimes seen of impaired individuals in Roman cemeteries. This may suggest that the individual was not ostracized or seen as a burden to their community, or at least to the people who buried them. Research into health-related care is important, and it helps us to better understand the lived experiences of individuals with physical impairments and those who may have cared for them. It can also aid in our understanding of social attitudes in the past and give us a glimpse at the possible medical knowledge and treatment available to people during these time periods. Given the small sample size of individuals assessed, it is difficult to determine whether Skeleton 131's treatment was unique or the norm for King's Home and Roman Britain as a whole. Additional information regarding civilian life and by extent care during the Romano-British period is limited, and as such it is difficult to draw any larger conclusions from this research at the moment. Bioarchaeological studies of care on a larger sample size could lend themselves to gaining new information on Romano-British medical practices, treatment of the physically impaired, and attitude towards these individuals. As an island on the edge of empire permitted to maintain much of its native culture, assumptions as to the Romano-British beliefs cannot be drawn from the larger Roman Empire. Further information on and research into the lived experience of Romano-British people is still required. I'd like to thank the University of Bradford and specifically my supervisor, Dr. Shirley Curtis Summers, and my co-supervisor, Professor Keith Manchester. Uh, thank you very much.